And to all our friends, family, and colleagues abroad, this is Dan Dyker, Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. I'm sitting with my esteemed uh, colleague, uh, Professor Ron Schleifer of Ariel University, one of the leading uh, authorities in psychological warfare uh, operations. will be joining us today as our special guest. And I'm, of, of course, joined by my esteemed colleague and very good friend, uh, Luc- Lieutenant Colonel Reserve Maurice Hirsch, former uh, uh, military prosecutor in Judea and Samaria. This is day 26 of uh, the uh, Hamas uh, Israel war, uh, following the October 7th uh, massacre, unprecedented carnage in the state of Israel. And Israel is now entering, is in the middle of its second stage, uh, intensifying its ground operation against the Hamas leadership. What we see now, uh, as Maurice will fill you in in just a moment before we turn to Professor Schleifer for his uh, deeper analysis uh, and context create and context creation uh, in the psychological, the deep psychological warfare aspects of this uh, of the Hamas Iran uh, uh, warfare, uh, is that we are seeing more and more diplomatic repercussions as the war continues and intensifies. This is, um, uh, for example, the Bahraini envoy to Israel has been called back by the Bahraini Parliament just several hours ago, and President uh, Joe Biden has called for what he calls a humanitarian pause uh, in the in the fighting, uh, which uh, again is a, a challenge uh, uh, to Israel because uh, any kind of Hamas leadership stalling for time uh, puts uh, uh, Israel's strategy at greater risk, as well as the completely unresolved issue of the hostages, which the uh, the uh, the Iran-backed Hamas has continued to hold in gross violation of all uh, minimal norms of international law. Uh, so we are going to dis- we're really going to we're going to be discussing uh, the psychological warfare uh, uh, context and ramifications of this on of this uh, deepening uh, Israel ground operation. But before we do that, I'm going to turn to Maurice Hirsch just to ask him, Maurice, for your very few minute. Uh, update on where we are today, day 26 of the uh, Hamas-Israel war. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, yes, we're, we're, we're talking about the 7th of October massacre, 1,400 people murdered, um, another 5,200 uh, plus injured, some, some still fighting for their lives. Another 242 people, that's an update from yesterday, another two people confirmed cases of um, of hostage-taking kidnapped by Hamas and are being held by Hamas. Um, At the same time, we've seen some 8,500 rockets, missiles being fired at Israel into our civilian population, continuing on all the time, even today, um, with a rocket salvo being fired earlier this afternoon at Be'er Sheva, um, one of Israel's uh, 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 biggest cities, and into the other areas in the the surrounding uh, um, uh, vicinity of the Gaza Strip. Um, what we've seen in response is the IDF now having attacked over 12,000 different targets in uh, the Gaza Strip. This is uh, um, part of that very extensive Hamas infrastructure that had really been placed everywhere around the Gaza Strip, in mosques, under mosques, in schools, under schools, round uh, uh, sensitive sites, um, in uh, refugee camps, underneath refugee camps, always remembering that there are some 500 kilometers of tunnels that Hamas has dug over the years using the international aid that was flowing in for ostensibly for the reconstruction of Gaza um, was then used by Hamas to uh, uh, build these fortifications. And as the Hamas leader, Musa Abu Marzouk, made very clear just a few days ago, the tunnels are there to protect Hamas and its terror infrastructure. They don't give a damn about the civilians. That's the international community's problem, um, using his words. Um, so that's what we're seeing, the ground uh, operation, obviously, moving forward. Uh, um, the IDF spokesman said this morning that the progress of the troops, without giving details, is uh, um, is actually good and well on schedule. Um, we're seeing reports, uh, we can't confirm or, or, or exactly say where they are, of IDF forces really getting closer and closer to um, to Gaza City from all directions. So, so that's something that we're uh, seeing all the time. Obviously, at the, at the same time, Israel um, has, uh, um, has managed to uh, uh, provide a solution for 120,000 um, of our civilians 
that are refugees within Israel um, running around just from that, from place to place. Um, they uh, also don't have anywhere permanent to be. Many of them, ha their houses destroyed entirely by the Hamas uh, and, and terrorist onslaught. Um, all the time we're discussing and we're here, as you mentioned, Dan, the call from President Biden um, to allow a humanitarian break in, uh, in, in the fighting. Um, this is something which only gives um, Hamas um, what they are demanding. Um, we saw today more foreign nationals being allowed to leave by Hamas via the Rafah crossing with Egypt, but only in return for receiving fuel. They are using even the foreign nationals as hostages um, in order to forward their, their, their uh, war effort. But the foreign countries and Biden and President Biden playing into that as well, saying, well, we have to give into this demand of Hamas in order to get these citizens out. Um, every time we, uh, we do so, uh, it's another uh, dent in our capability to, to restrict aid to Hamas and even um, going into the, into the population in Gaza, um, which is only one-sided humanitarian aid. We have heard nothing from the, the International Red Cross about visiting these 242 hostages. We've heard nothing about any type of willingness of Hamas to show any type of humanitarian support for these hostages. Um, and so, therefore, the humanitarian aid is a one-sided issue and a one-sided issue only. It's only for the Gazans, not for Israel and Israelis or the hostages. Um, that's on the Gaza front. On the, the northern front, we are continuing on with that constant tit-for-tat of uh, Hezbollah, the other Iranian proxy, trying to constantly undermine the security situation in the north, constantly shooting at Israeli forces, anti-tank uh, uh, um, groups and, and, and commandos, setting up and most of the time being struck by the air, from the air by uh, Israeli forces, but also managing um, um, to, uh, to carry out their attacks um, on a number of occasions and also constant rocket fire from the uh, um, Judean Samaria. We're seeing the continued high level of, uh, um, of, of terror just today, a terrorist attack uh, carried out in, in, in the Shomron in Samaria. Um, and an Israeli murdered there. Um, constant, constant uh, um, efforts by by the terrorists and their uh, uh, assistants um, to carry out uh, more attacks. Many of those involved in the terror dan has to be mentioned are members of the Palestinian Authority security forces. Yesterday we saw three terrorists uh, um, neutralized in in Janine. Two of them were members of uh, the Palestinian security forces. So that's something that we also have to take into account um, as uh, President Biden and the U.S. administration continues this push to maintain uh, um, its relations with the Palestinian Authority, um, while at the same time the Palestinian Authority is actively involved in terror. In Israel, we're seeing a relative uh, calm from the Israeli Arab population, um, different from some of the estimations and some of uh, uh, what we saw in, uh, uh, in May 2021. When, when some parts of the Arab Israeli Arab population joined Hamas, joined our enemies, and were involved in pogroms within the mixed cities. Um, it's a little bit different for, the, for the, the Jerusalem Arab population, where there we're seeing a little bit more uh, um, involvement, also in terror, a stabbing of, a, of an Israeli policeman just a few days ago. Um, today, uh, um, the, the, the ISA, um, the Shabak, the Shin Bet, um, allowed publication of the fact that just a month ago that arrested a cell um, that was more connected to ISIS, Daesh, and uh, uh, was, inten was intending to um, lure Israeli policemen with shooting attacks into, a, uh, um, into an apartment and then to blow the apartment up on them um, and kill the policemen. So that's uh, something that we're seeing as well. Obviously, that wider area with Yemen declaring war in the Houthis, uh, um, shooting uh, missiles and uh, uh, ballistic missiles and even UAVs towards Israel. Um, they had, had by, at the time, have been uh, shot down. Um, the one missile that fell uh, um, in Egypt, in Taba, um, causing relatively uh, extensive damage. Um, so that's really the update from uh, um, from the, the, the war scenes on the different fronts. Um, tense all the way in the last uh, uh, 24 hours, another five Israeli soldiers 
um, at least as we're talking, that uh, uh, it's been released, um, have been killed. Um, so that also, uh, um, that, 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 that casualty count um, growing all the time down. Yeah, clearly, as we move deeper and deeper towards Gaza City, the uh, the dangers are uh, even greater, and that accounts for some 15 soldiers were lost in the last couple of days, uh, especially uh, one where an explosive device land, uh, was uh, was uh, uh, tagged on or glued onto the APAC, uh, onto the uh, half-track that they were traveling on, and that's what accounted for the loss of a number of soldiers, tragically. One of the one of the extraordinarily, um, I would say, uh, different and 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 uh, obvious uh, aspects of this particular campaign uh, has been the psyops or psychological operations, which has been an, an Iranian regime uh, brand. I, I would say in the last forty four years, uh, uh, Professor Ron Schleifer of Aria University has written a number of books on psychological operations and warfare uh, with, spe with specific emphasis on the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, and, and including uh, Hamas. Uh, uh, Professor Schleifer, good to have you with us today on this uh, update. Give us, give us. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're not surprised you've been following this uh, for, especially since the beginning of the Oslo Accords back in the oh, early 90s. First Intifada, which would be in 1987. Yes. So uh, help our uh, viewers and our, our you know friends, family, and colleagues abroad understand the psychological operation aspect of the strategy of the Hamas uh, ISIS Hamas Iran network here. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to show you one slide before we uh, before I go into that. I just want to make as an introduction, talking about psychological warfare is basically um, the um, application of uh, of um, um, marketing techniques and, and and PR techniques into uh, into the war zone. Basically, what we are looking at is. Uh, um, if if uh, persuasion means are so uh, so, so successful in um, in marketing in selling us products, why not use them uh, in war? And today everybody is uh, is much more uh, um, uh, gullible, um, much more open uh, to receive those messages because each and every one of us is a sending and receiving station. Um, I'd like to show you the the one slide. Uh, could we have the the Arafat slide? Yeah. Okay. I'd like you to take a look at that slide. It was taken. Uh, this picture was taken um, in 1996. Eh, sorry. Say again. In 1969. 1969. Uh, and. Um, on the left hand side, you can uh, you know this is young Arafat, and on the right hand side is the uh, general uh, Neguyen Vujiap, the chief of the head chief of staff of the uh, North Vietnamese Army, the v and the Viet Cong. Um, so the Russians were behind the whole uh, scheme of setting up the PLO. Um, sent Arafat uh, to learn to study the uh, art and science of revolutionary warfare, which General Giap was developing on the, based on the um, on the teaching of uh, and the application of Mao Zedong in China. Um, I can't I can't uh, help myself but to not to uh, draw your attention to the kafia of Arafat. Everybody now knows the trick, but uh, there were decades where it would have been complete surprise. The uh, shape the uh, uh, the shape of the kafia of Arafat is in the shape of the land of Palestine from the river to the sea. And if you think that I'm paranoid, you have every right to. But uh, if you Google uh, on Google Images uh, Arafat, you will see that in the 100,000 photographs of Arafat uh, on the internet, each and every single uh, photograph is in the shape of his kafia, and he was the only one who was allowed to wear his kafia at the same. The psychological technique behind it is called subliminal message. Um, okay. 
Now, what uh, Arafat was studying uh, in Hanoi at that time, um, the, uh, Giap told, uh, instructed the young PLO uh, operatives, saying, uh, you have to learn from us. Uh, our perception of the struggle is that the main struggle against America is not the jungles of Vietnam, it's rather the streets of Washington. Meaning behind this, this um, behind this, uh, behind this saying, is that the uh, warfare, the actual bloodletting, it doesn't matter as much as the political struggle matters. Uh, I would say politics is above above the military struggle, and when you conduct the military struggle, you always have to think about the political aspects. Now, why is that such? Uh, why is that such a tremendous uh, tool? When, because when it was applied against Israel, uh, the IDF has this maxim uh, that officially uh, the army is not involved in politics. Now we know that it's completely different in the past year. But whenever somebody dared to mention anything political, it was immediately uh, charged to uh, saying. Uh, we are uh, not dealing with politics. Now, psychological warfare is the essence of politics in warfare. Um, but and, but the IDF, for various reasons, uh, does not uh, or is not willing to deploy psychological warfare, but rather focuses on the, on the physical and the kinetic uh, aspect of the war, meaning uh, in um, the IDF is reluctant uh, to drive a wedge uh, among the uh, Palestinians, uh, let's say Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, uh, 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 between the Hamas and uh, and the and the PLO, um, but rather prefers to bomb them to pieces. Um, there are reasons, historical reasons for that, uh, mainly. The um, the attitude that uh, we are even Menachem Begin uh, stated it once: we are no Goebbelses. That's when to say why we don't do propaganda, why don't we do propaganda activities uh, against the Arabs? To say we are not Goebbelses. Um, what? Uh, okay. Let me, let, yeah, let me just continue. Uh, this is the current. This is the current. This conflict, is the current. Right? Yeah. Right. So I want to apply what you've given us uh, regarding General Jep and Arafat yeah. to the current uh, to the current conflict. Um, this is the same girl saved the three different opportunities with the same different uh, clothes. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the we don't uh, there's no collateral damage, meaning that uh, we don't kill civilians. We probably do, especially when the Hamas is uh, using them as human shields. But uh, I have another example here, the third and last one. Um, yeah, uh, it's this is from Lebanon from 2006. And we see um, the guy on the left um, uh, as a uh, taken out of the uh, of the ruins. And then uh, an hour later, he is conducting another scene. Um, we're trying to say that uh, the uh, the enemy lies, but uh, it's not working. Uh, it's not working too well. Um, <clears throat> another what the uh, what um, the Palestinians have learned from uh, Giap is to find a chink in the armor of the Western society, and the chink in the armor is civilians. Now they thought so. Uh, um, Giap told them how he did it against America. So uh, Giap placed the uh, the the homes of the munition workers uh, of the uh, of North Vietnam next to the factories. So uh, when American Air Force would bomb the munition plants. It would kill uh, thousands of the families of the workers there, and then um, the North Vietnamese would uh, call the international media, including American media, which were uh, some some outlets were considered radical, 
uh, and uh, invited them in and would say, look how horrible, what monstrous uh, behavior uh, America is conducting here. So Arafat started in the mid 70s uh, to place gun cannons, uh, art his artillery and Katyusha rockets inside hospitals in South Lebanon, etc. Now, the way it moved from uh, the PLO, it moved towards Hamas, is that PLO, if quite a number of PLO operatives switched sides because either the Hamas was more lucrative than, uh, than, than the PLO, they paid better, or some of them became uh, really religious and, and, and were convinced that, uh, that Islam is the solution. Um, etc. So they brought their uh, experience uh, into Hamas, and Hamas is doing the same now using human shields. Uh, it has been doing this since the first intifada, uh, but the first intifada of 1987 and onward till 1990 was uh, was perceived as nonviolent. Uh, except for a few Hamas abductions and, and, and killing of Israeli soldiers. But the Palestinians in general were perceived as not as nonviolent, only sending uh, stones or uh, um, throwing stones. And so Israel tried to divert it into rocks, but uh, that was the perception in Hebrew, uh, uh, in Hebrew, um, uh, Evan is a stone. And uh, it was perceived as merely as a pebble. In the second intifada, it was already a violent one. It was after the Oslo Accords. Uh, and the PLO was copying its uh, suicide uh, bombers uh, from Hamas. So there is a movement between, between the two to which one is more, uh, is more extreme. Um, Another sorry is that that's where we really saw the uh, the most public form of, of psychological warfare was actually between the Hamas and the the PLO and and Fatah. I mean, Al Aqsa Martyrs Brigade and those. Is, there's actually psychological war where they were the audiences, not only the West. The West was also an audience as, as uh, in their competition for right, murder. Right. They, in psychological warfare, we're talking about three main target audiences. We're talking about the home audience, and one and because we have to persuade the home audience that uh, they have to support the war and they have to justify the war. Uh, the the biggest example is the uh, is the America in Vietnam when the government didn't have the support of the home audience, so uh, America pulled out and gave the. Even though it was meaning militarily, it it gave uh, it gave in to the political pressure and uh, and so and gave the victory to north uh, to northern Vietnam. Uh, the second audience is the enemy. This is when we practically use uh, the psychological warfare in order, as the saying goes, make your own soldiers uh, patriots and make enemy soldiers pacifists. Um, psychological warfare is designed to um, uh, to lower the morale of the enemy forces. Uh, but when the uh, and 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 of course there's the the third the, the the neutrals those who are not directly connected but have an influence on the on the conflict. Now. With Hamas, it is difficult. It is difficult to deploy. Why? Because Hamas has stressed and indoctrinated uh, its audience from child, early childhood, uh, to uh, to their um, to the mid twenties, that not to fear death. Now, all the experience that the Western society has in psychological warfare like America did in the first Gulf War, uh, where approached the Iraqi soldiers, I told them, look, I can let you out of the front and I can show you how. And, um, and it uh, gave them through leaflets, the maps and how they should conduct themselves. And 70,000 Iraqi soldiers surrendered. 70,000 soldiers 
it was like, uh, I don't know, 20% of the Iraqi army, 15% of the Iraqi army, which surrendered because they received pieces of paper. Now, this is all based on the will to survive. But where your enemy is, is stating that we don't fear death, and basically you'll do us a favor if you kill us, all the knowledge that we have on on psychological warfare against an enemy is uh, is is a problem, um, and the Israeli way of conducting a war is um, is more on the physical side, as I was saying, and, um, m- and most Israelis are fearful of what would the world say. What will be the reaction of the international community? Uh, and the this is, I'll come to speak now for a... a let me, let me just jump in. I, I want to jump in and, and sure. just uh, ask you another question. Yeah. What makes Israel historically so hesitant and reticent to use PSYOP operations against, especially against radical Islamic terror groups like the Hezbollah, like the Hamas, headed by the Iranian regime, when it knows for so many years that it is losing that war to the international uh, community via social networks, via instant media, and so on. Okay. Um, I'll start from the deepest, deepest explanation. Uh, it's about anti-Semitism. The, the Israeli attitude is say the Goim hate us anyway, so what's the point? Whatever we do, uh, it's uh, it'll be a waste of time. So uh, when in the money that we can invest in psychological warfare, we can invest in another tank or another airplane. Uh, this is one uh, one layer. Uh, secondly, the Jewish people have been uh, apologizing for uh, how long? For twenty five hundred years. Um, so it's in within our genetic structure to apologize and say, look, uh, uh, we know we're different, but we're good different. Um, and, and thirdly, um, the Jewish people has learned to fight since the beginning of the, uh, uh, the, uh, Zionist movement in the early 1920s. Uh, and we're still struggling with fighting, and uh, we need to learn that. Uh, so uh, we didn't learn that because of the lessons of the Holocaust. Um, Menachem Begin, uh, who deployed brilliant psychological warfare against the, the British mandate, um, and called them Nazis, those who liberated uh, Bergen-Belsen, etc., but the same soldiers, and then they were called a few years later, they were uh, called Nazis. And when Menachem Begin came to power, he he immediately uh, refused uh, to do to deal with with uh, the subject of psychological warfare uh, immediately. So there was there was none uh, none of that. Um, and then um, last explanation is nobody in the West likes psychological warfare. Uh, or it's in former uh, terminology propaganda. Uh, America doesn't like it. Uh, France doesn't like it. NATO doesn't like it. And every every time, every war, there uh, people realize the army realized. Oh God, we need to do something about it. So they hastily put together an organization. And when the war is over, the organization is immediately, immediately dismantled. Uh, this has been the situation in Israel, just the same. And uh, this is um, um, this is why I think this is why, the, in a nutshell, uh, this I've been written, I've been writing on that extensively. But I, uh, in a nutshell, these are the explanations. Uh, here, here we see in this particular uh, conflagration the hospital in Gaza. Yeah, uh, that the Palestinian Islamic Jihad either misfired and it landed in the parking lot or they fired it on purpose yeah yeah but either way professor schleifer it was very well known by the hamas leadership and the palestinian islamic jihad that 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 their immediate misfire or on purpose or or intentional fire and blaming it immediately blaming israel was going to have a, a ripple effect across social networks across mainstream media and indeed they were right 
It took Israel 12 hours to respond. Right. Uh, and that, that, in a nutshell, is a, a problem uh, for Israel, even on, on a strategic level. It is. Uh, the rule of the game is to deny immediately and attack the enemy. Okay, and then by the time the truth comes out, then it's already too late because you already supplied a new story, which uh, which is fra- which frames the agenda. In Israel, um, these senior officers are uh, trained in America. Uh, they are trained in uh, in university or colleges, either in the United States or by uh, lecturers who are trained in the United States. And they talk about credibility and they talk about uh, we are no liars and we're no Goebbelses, et cetera. Um, that, that, uh, that explains why, uh, like in Muhammad Adura, uh, the iconic image of the Second Intifada, which caused us so much damage, took the IDF. First of all, the IDF took the blame. And then he was saying maybe and not, and we don't want to deal with that, and we don't want to reawaken that uh, that that scandal, etc. Uh, it's a matter of know-how. It's a matter of know-how, and we're not trained in that. And with the IDF and Israel as a society, refuse to deal with that. Look at the what's happening with our uh, uh, Hasbara uh, government ministries. Okay, um, lack of funds, uh, lack of um, training, uh, lack of political experience. So the uh, minister uh, of the, the newly appointed minister of Hasbara gave up in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the the war and beginning of tensions. Um, she she gave up and said, "I'm incapable." And uh, those who appointed her knew exactly, uh, and the, of course, the senior bureaucracy gave her hell. Uh, and uh, meaning, in short, we don't treat uh, Hasbara seriously. Uh, so if the government doesn't work, so the people took to work. So uh, the, there's um, hundreds and thousands of initiatives which are taken uh, by, uh, by Jewish communities, by uh, in Israeli society, by private uh, enterprises, and they're trying to fill in, try to fill in the gap. What needs to happen for Israel to change its approach? We, we've, you and I have been talking about this for, for years. Uh, my, my doctorate deals with perception warfare, having quoted you a lot throughout that dissertation. But it seems that as we speak right now on this Zoom, there is no Israeli team in the National Security Council in front of you know uh, forty-five inch screens, scanning and scouring the Telegram in Arabic for all of these uh, disinformation uh, declarations and battling them uh, all over the uh, all over the social networks. It seems that this is intolerable in twenty twenty-three that Israel is a fighting a kinetic, a kinetic war, but not fighting the disinformation war properly. Wow. How much time do I have? Another couple of minutes to, uh, just to, to weigh in. I mean, I know I'm touching right. a sore. Yeah. Look, remember, it was General Jap of yes. North Vietnam that told Arafat yes. on the record yes. that he has to fashion himself as a state builder right. to the West, which right. he did. He also listened to Ceausescu of Romania, who told right. him exactly the same thing, documented in, I think, in, uh, uh, in Ephraim Karsh's, also in Ephraim Karsh's book. On on uh, Arafat uh, and yeah. uh, called Arafat's yeah. war, right. uh, and still, it, for some reason, there is a conception in Israel that the soft power war is less important than than uh, Merkava tanks and F thirty fives. Yes, uh, that is the situation. How how we change that? Uh, we need uh, first of all to create a um, intellectual sphere that this is important. And we need to uh, persuade senior Israelis, uh, or let's say we will dump the senior. It's already too late for them. Uh, they surround now uh, um, Gal- the uh, Minister of Defense, Gallant. Uh, they surround him now, and they're talking more kinetics and more and more kinetics. Um, we should start with the young officers, and that would... Uh, 
that would yield fruit in a decade or two. Uh, this is the only way that I can see where we can change. Uh, they, we need to translate uh, manuals into Hebrew. Israelis don't read English. Um, we need uh, to um, to um, give uh, the military academy, uh, we need to, to influence them uh, as to the importance of soft uh, warfare and not just uh, kinetic war. Uh, we need to publish books uh, for the Israeli, the Israeli educated audience. Uh, so they would say that I'm not sending my son to be a, a, a professional liar, uh, as it's popularly considered, but as an important contributor uh, to Israeli victory. So there's a lot of things that need to be done on the civic side. I, m I mentioned that at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, Wartime Diplomacy Communication Center, right here at the JCPA, we have uh, a lot of uh, special operations, perception operations, influence operations, units volunteering from the IDF, uh, working on a disinformation campaign, doing short form videos. We, we've we actually asked for the support uh, of the public to support us. We need uh, additional hardware. We need to, to fund our marketing campaign for social networks in North America. But we have 50 videos uh, that we've already done. One minute videos, good for TikTok and Instagram uh, that we are uh, we're getting tens of thousands of, of uh, positive engagements on those. And uh, with, uh, you know, we're seeking four or $500,000 to focus mostly in the marketing. We have the content creation, we have the virality, uh, and we have the best, you know, copywriters. But we are, we are leading that fight, uh, Ron, into uh, the North American uh, uh, social network space, as well as in Arabic. We also have Arabic speaking Israelis and Arab Muslim reporters from the region that are cooperating with us quietly because they uh, are convinced that the key to instability and subversion in the Middle East is the Iranian regime-led octopus, which includes Hezbollah, includes Hamas, it includes the Houthis, uh, it includes the Iraqi, what they call special forces under the Iranian regime control. And one major war that we can win is we're doing it in the private sector at JCPA, is the war against this crusade of disinformation, which uh, let's bear in mind that the BDS campaign, the Students for Justice in Palestine, the Palestine Solidarity Committee across the Ivy League and 300 campuses in the United States paved the way for the legitimacy of the October 7th massacre. That's how serious disinformation is. I'm convinced I know for sure that's why Professor Schleifer has taken up this cause. He, this gentleman right here, is really the pioneer uh, of the whole psychological warfare uh, phenomenon. Even in, in, in academics, we'll mention to our audience that you were really a lone voice uh, uh, for many, many years. I'm happy to say that uh, after, after having written my dissertation on this particular issue with the Palestinian National Movement, Perception Warfare, Hybrid Warfare in the West, um, that uh, we are really uh, uh, focusing on what they call in Hebrew toda'a or perception or influence warfare at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs as a part of our uh, strategic mandate here uh, and our communications uh, strategy, which you'll be hearing much more about. I want to thank you in the meantime, Professor Ron Schleifer of Ariel University and author of, of numerous books on psychological warfare uh, and uh, the Palestinians and, and other radical Islamic uh, terror groups, thank you very much. This will be available, recorded to those that were not able to um, see it and experience it live. And we will also be doing a brief and sending that out on our email list. Please sign up for the daily alert. Uh, please join us every day. It will be uh, go, now we're six hours ahead of Eastern Standard Time. We will start doing these at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is 9 a.m. Dan, Dan, Dan if, if I could just interrupt and say that it, to the best of my understanding, America moves their clocks on on uh, late Saturday night into oh, Sunday okay. morning. So we so, should keep it. We should keep it at nine o'clock. So uh, we, should keep, we, can, we can leave it at ten o'clock Israel at four o'clock Israel time, okay. which will remain um, as uh, um, as uh, as nine o'clock uh, um, America time. Very very good. Well, in the meantime, thank you all for joining us. Uh, please come to jcpa.org for all of the latest updates. Uh, and uh, assessments, analysis, context, uh, and do sign up for the Daily Alert. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again. Uh, we'll see you. I think we have a short one tomorrow. 
at the uh, same time, do we not, Maurice? We have a, a sort of a wrap up. Yeah, just a quick one. We'll see you again. Up. Yep, and we'll see you again on Sunday at nine a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a good end of week, a peaceful end of week, a quiet end of week to everybody, to all our friends and colleagues.